Hello everybody and welcome to episode number five of the year of Get It. And uh, today I'm very privileged to have a conversation with Mark Smalley, um, a philosopher, a speaker, a writer, um, but a very practical person also. So Mark, welcome and it's nice to have you to have you here. Um, let's change the view so that everybody can see you. And um yeah, we're talking about product usership. Yeah, thank you, my friend. It's it's not often that smally and practical are combined in one sentence. Philosophy, yes, I like to think about things. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean we've had some conversations that was really practical. Yeah, so um, and that's why I say it. So if if it's not others' experience, it certainly is mine. No, good. Well, good to hear. Good to hear. Okay, yeah. Great. So, um, product usership. Yeah. Uh, well, self, self, self coined. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I'm, I'm not aware of anybody else having coined it, and it was. It came from the the popularity of the term product ownership mm -hmm. in the agile domain. Scrum in particular, yeah. people talk about product owners as being the representative of the business, um, having authority, uh, legitimacy as well, and certain skills to give direction to development, specify the requirements, give feedback on it, which is great. You know, it's got, got to happen. But my concern was more at the end of the value stream when something's been delivered and is operational. Um, how do you get value out of it? Because somebody, and in, in, if, in fact, if you if you think if you think about the value stream, uh, and take a step back, value streams in IT often start. You know, where do they start? Often with something like requirements. You've got mm. specifications of what you've got to build. Then you you execute a number of steps, and you end up. The Scrum community often talks about potentially shippable increments of software, which is their definition of done. We've got a piece of software, an increment that's potentially shippable. We're done. Right, somebody else. So that, but that's, you know, we're not there yet. It's got to be shipped first. It's yeah. got to become operational. And great, we've got it operational. We're providing service, service you could talk about two forms of service performance i do something for you i paint your house for instance performance but we also talk about affordance i afford you access to this information system or to my car you know you can use my car or my garden yeah. tools um, and that's what we often do with information systems we give people we afford people access to the systems and that's when the rubber hits the road. That's when the magic happens. That's when actual return on the initial in investment is realized because it, mm -hmm. it's only when people um, people use the information that they get out of the system um, to take better decisions. You know, that's, that's the function of information to allow you to take better informed decisions but it's only but it's not enough to take a decision it's only when somebody acts on the decision that's been informed by information that they got out of that wonderful information system that the it department helped to develop that, that actual return on investment is realized mm -hmm. and that's that area the actual use product usership um Who's just think about the think about um, an organization that you're familiar with, current past customer, possibly an organization that you worked you work for, and think about the users or think about yourself as user. Think about the applications you use. Do you understand the would well, take something trivial word, uh, or at least something that something that everybody can can um, can associate to uh, relate to. Do you understand? The, do you know what functionality Word has to offer? I, uh, only, only the, the stuff that I use. Yeah, yeah, um, basic, basic stuff. stuff not, not familiar with the functionality. I'm not even sure whether I'm using it well. Uh, if you're talking about an information system that provides information to to you, a, possibly a HR system or something like that, uh, or financial system. 
are you interpreting the data correctly? You see lots of data fields, and if something says customer, is that a current customer or a past customer? When's, when's somebody a past customer? If they haven't bought something for a year? Is it is Are you a customer when you've just registered on the site but haven't actually bought anything yet? Is that a customer? Yeah. So what are we talking about? So about the functionality, about the data, that mm. that those so and, and and but the the question really is, and whose concern is it? Yeah, absolutely. whose responsibility is it to make sure that the users are actually getting the, the desired return on investment? And and so if we talk about the, the this concept that everybody is getting now that value is actually co created, um, there is so little emphasis on the on the end use of the product or the service. And, and the related responsibilities, accountabilities, education, um, as you say, understanding, um, uh, not only functionality, but potential, um, that it is actually just a vast open field. We, we just throw things at users and expect them to, to do the best with it. Yeah. yeah. It, it sort of makes me think about... Uh, um, what was the guy, uh, uh, Ted Levitt? Uh, you know, when he, we talked about yeah, holes and uh, holes and drills. Um, and interesting enough is, as a result of that conversation, I think it was um, uh, Peter Drucker who first coined um, the the term in 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 a, a sentence where he said that. You know, we need to actually understand the job that the customer is doing with this product or service that we that we offering them. Um, so let's talk about both sides of the fence: the the provider of the product and the service, and the recipient of the product and the service. How do we make the flow of information and the realization of value better? Yeah, I don't know. Well, let's let's let's. I haven't I haven't got a clip answer to that. But let's um, let's explore that. Um, you mentioned Drucker. This is just a distraction, so I can find some mental capacity to think about your question. <laughs> you know, if if you give things enough time, an answer will appear. So I'm I'm just playing for playing for time. Mm. Um, I I think it was it was also Clayton Christensen who who coined that 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 concept referred to the concept of jobs to be done yeah so he that's, sort of popularized it yes yeah that's, that's a good one as well so it's good good to refer to him as well mm. um but another thing when you mentioned drucker that came to mind and that refers more to the the front end of the value stream yeah is his statement that um the only two important functions in a in an organization in an enterprise are innovation and marketing yes the rest is just cost it's a pretty provocative statement mm. but i think it's right because if you if you gain if you think about that value chain which often value stream which often starts with requirements before somebody comes up with requirements somebody came up with an idea yes. if we do this and, and after the idea a hypothesis your first of pretty broad brush ballpark hypothesis if we inv if we do this then we'll get these results um and that sort of results in the business case if we do this then we'll make a make a million a year mm. just think about this just just to reinforce drucker's wisdom it was really extraordinary the kind of stuff he uh, he gave us to think about um, christensen what? also it's so sad that he's gone yeah, no, he's quite. Uh, it, there's, there's still some uh, some little video clips. Not many of him actually speaking about topics. So they're worth, and they're not pretty good quality either. But they're worth a look just to get a better feel, better feel of the man. But once that million a year profit or whatever has been established, that's your return potential. You can get that out. Yes. After that, it only goes downhill. As far as IT is concerned, the provocative statement that I make more often nowadays is that your job is not to make a mess of it. 
there's that potential okay. of, a, of a million a year to be realized your job is not to make a mess of it by delaying it by doing the wrong thing um instigating rework and stuff like that you'd probably get done in the end but take too long cost too much the same applies when it's in what it when it crosses the supplier user divide the mm -hmm. same on the user side not much that the users can do to get more than a million a year potential but they cert can certainly get less if they just as the it development and deployment and operations people if they don't they, if they don't know what they're doing um you know the, the users can do do the same thing they don't, just don't, don't get the potential so now i've I, distracted myself for a couple of minutes but i, <laughs> I, I had got quite that. a chuckle the other day um, I was listening to uh, to a session of David Cannon, and somebody sent a question and saying, you know, so how do you measure value on the IT side of the fence? Um, and I think he gave the right answer, and the right answer is you can't, um, because well, value you can, can only yeah, created you can, when you you can you can me measure the potential maybe, or you can assume the potential, but until it's consumed, how do you know? Yeah, well, you can, in a sense, and certainly in the commercial setting, I, I forget who coined the term or the terms. Uh, somebody coined the term uh, exchange value and in-use value. There's two concepts. In-use value is the what you do it for, yeah. trying to do, do something useful. Exchange value is the commercial value that's exchanged between the provider and the consumer. Uh, the recipient um which represents value for the provider they've they've achieved a certain amount of but it's only sustainable when the in use value absolutely they discover afterwards that you know sort of commensurate with the with the exchange value so let's buy some more stuff mm. um so in in a sense it you could represent it as a proxy you could say that the exchange value mm. if it's a commercial proxy exchange matrix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the proxy. It's a start. It's a starting point. Yeah, yeah. It as long as it's an, an interim measure, until we actually get the product usership bit right, so that we can properly measure the the outcome of the job that the user has got for our product or service. Yeah. Now, and how do you, and how do you measure that? That's that's also Ooh. an interesting. Yeah, also yeah, an interesting exactly. topic because it's it's unique and it's um, it's individual. It's very emotional. I think you know yeah, we and I, I of, often frequently, certainly the last last couple of years, I've been thinking about the ancient Greeks quite a lot. Don't know why. Probably should have guilty about not studying them fifty years ago. Um, but they, they well, possibly modern Greeks still use the terms logos, ethos, yes. and pathos. Pathos, yeah, pathos, yeah. And that's a bit of a um, similar to the what some people call the ecstasy, uh, the the transcendental values, truth, goodness, and beauty, mm. sort of go hand in hand. Now you don't need to tell IT people anything about logic, about logos. We're good at logic. That's that's mm. our business. I think we're increasingly comfortable with the phenomenon of uh, being responsible for our unintended consequences, intended ethos, and unintended yeah. consequences, ethos, ethics. There's a great, um, great chapter the, for the ITIL High Velocity IT book, for which I was the lead editor. I asked Dave Snowden, the guy that many people know as the, the guy behind the Kinefin framework. I asked Dave to write a piece about ethics, and it was, it was one of the best pieces that was was delivered for the for the whole book. Uh, I wrote about half of it, and twenty one people wrote specific topics, which I sort of integrated to some kind of coherent whole. But that, um, and in fact, one of the one of the nicest phrases in the ninety thousand words that we collected for high velocity IT. We only published 60,000 because that was the brief for the book, but I collected 90,000. But one of, the, one of the, the most memorable for me sentences was, just as organizations track their cash flow, they should also monitor the flow of virtue through the organization. That sounds very stoic. 
And I helped, yeah, nice one. And I, and I thought I thought that phrase, the flow of virtue, was was spot on. And that's that's, that's one of Dave's um, uh, contributions to that. So so getting back to that, so you don't need to teach IT people about about logos uh, or ethos. We're getting better at, but beauty, pathos. Yeah, I think that's we should make things that appeal to the senses more. Mm. Um, and, and can and, we say to to emotion? Yeah, oh yeah, no, yes, definitely. I yeah. I think we 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 recognise to an insufficient degree how decisions are firstly emotional decisions, which we then post rationalise, sort of come up with a story that I bought something because no, you didn't. You, you bought it because you wanted it. Yeah. <laughs> You do, you know, you do something. There's, by the way, for the for the um, our audience, um, if you want to spend a very enjoyable forty hours, yes, I can recommend something that I got suckered into last year. I discovered a guy called uh, Robert Sapolsky, Professor okay. Robert Sapolsky, Stanford University. If you look up uh, um, Sapolsky lectures. I think the title is Human Behavioral Biology. There are 25 lectures, Stanford University, to rec recorded while he's teaching, about 90 minutes, mostly 80, 70, 80, 90 minutes long. I watched the first minute of the first lecture and got suckered into wa watching all 25 of them. Okay, and awesome. It was, and one of the best things I did last year, absolutely fabulous in terms of understanding when I take an action, a microsecond, millisecond before something, before the action, something happened in my brain, but that was influenced by my genetic composite, how I woke up, uh, um, mm. epigenetics, things that have influenced my stuff, cultural, my mother's hormones when I was in her fetus. All of these components sort of build up to influencing your behavior. There's so much that you, 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 just simply not aware of yes. pheromones for instance the fact that we mm -hmm. can't uh, we can't smell each other is influencing our interaction sure that's, yeah that's... i can believe that uh, uh, i think they said that you know 70 percent of communication is is uh, actually observing somebody yeah and the whole body observing yeah zoom doesn't cut it <laughs> no but you know things things like pheromones <coughs> Pheromones which which influence um, unconsciously your mm. behavior, you will react to things. So you know, decisions decisions are emotional. We have stories because we're meaning seeking beings. We have to have stories to explain the world. Otherwise, we'll go bonkers. It's mm. a survival mechanism. We have to give meaning to a tree, although a tree, there's no intrinsic meaning to anything. At least that's my opinion. Yet we have to give meaning to things. Otherwise, it drives us mad. So we post-rationalize our emotional decisions. Yeah, you know, some you can control them to a degree. Your prefrontal prefrontal cortex has a has a, a, a moderating effect. So you should try and reduce your impulses. Um, but it's, 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 usually, it's, it's pretty much emotional based. So, so we do have to when we're doing. Sir, I was going to say providing service, but doing service with somebody. We have to be aware that they will be reacting and evaluating, giving value to the the act, service action interaction, primarily emotionally. So it's not what business impact have you had, but what does somebody think about the business impact that you achieved? Yeah. And and th th that sort of brings us to the the, the issue of trying to understand experience rather than service levels also, I suppose, yes. So that also comes into it. Yeah. But that implies that we have to have a either very good insight or very good contact with our user community to do things better and to be able to unlock a more value. But that's quite tricky. Yeah, it's very tricky. It's um, 
I did a little bit on the topic of of the role of empathy in mm -hmm. in service provision, service receipt. Um, I was going to say consu consummation, <laughs> getting into a different area. Okay. Um, and came across the distinction in empathy between cognitive empathy and affective or emotional empathy. Okay. Cognitive empathy is understanding where somebody is in a, could be a customer journey or a supplier journey. I'm mm -hmm. currently in a supplier journey with one of my customers being processed as a vendor, getting a purchase order, stuff like that. And it's a bumpy journey. Um, they don't seem to understand cognitively realize in which stage of the journey I am, which information I need either to reassure myself that things are going on track or I need information to take the next step. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's the cognitive side. You've got to realize where your counterpart is, your customer is in their journey and what they need. That's the cognitive part. Mm. And then, you get onto the affect, affective or emotional dimension of empathy, where you've got a, a bit of an understanding about how they feel about things. Are they nervous? Is it the first time that you've interacted? Is it a first time customer? They're trying to understand the strange language that you use to explain things. I've just just engaged a um, uh, sort of isolate the insulate the the house better um, double glazing. Okay. Sort of up the quality. <clears throat> I have absolutely no idea how to talk about glass to a professional glazier. So I'm sort of, you know, what, what, talk what's about our values. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That kind of stuff. You know, <laughs> how do we communicate with each other? So, so as as a newbie in a in a certain environment, if I'm doing business with you for the first time, I would appreciate it if you would explain things in basic terms, just to reassure me. This is going to happen next. It happened. This is the next step. If we'd done business 10 times before, 20 times before, I need a different treatment. Don't explain that. to I don't need it. You know, you don't need to yeah. explain the basic steps. So that's that emotional empathy. You're understanding how I feel about things. I feel confident doing business with you. We can take it a bit quicker. The contract will come later. And that, so those two, I found, I found those two, those, those two dimensions of empathy, cognitive empathy, understa understanding where somebody is in, in the customer journey, which information they need, hugely about information, and then understanding what's their current disposition feeling and, and responding appropriately. I just want to, I just realized that we've been going down a rabbit hole here, but <clears throat> actually the original, <laughs> the, the original question is not answered. <laughs> it may never may be posing the question is much more important than the answer <laughs> you, yeah. you, you it makes me think of Ira so you, the, you got it. <laughs> remember the AI kept on telling Will Smith that's not the right question yeah. that's not the right question that's the right question what's the answer no, I don't know you have to go and think about that <laughs> um, so we talk a lot about service providers and their responsibility of ensuring that value is created and unlocked but what about the other side of the fence yeah no it's really a good it, product usership it takes it takes two to tango i'd like to see the uh, we often do surveys customers customer satisfaction surveys for instance is the customer satisfied why not turn it around Supplier satisfaction surveys. That's an interesting concept. Okay, like that. Are, are you are you a good customer? Of course, there's you know you've got it's embedded in the word subservient. There's there is the relationship. It's an interesting topic. This the relationship between a, a customer and a supplier is asymmetric, mm. in the sense that well, it's a sort of I think in relationships you've got two things. One is trust. The other thing is power. Mm. Realizing who's got the most power. If you if you're dealing with um, uh, another rabbit hole, if you're dealing with a cloud service provider, uh, certainly the large ones dictate their terms and conditions. 
you know, either do business with AWS or you don't. You, you don't negotiate with them about the SLAs. And I, I joke with my ITIL colleagues or IT service management colleagues that we should have a practice service dictator management how to cope, don't laugh, how to cope with, with, with these, this category of providers who you have alongside providers who are more flexible and you know, willing to accommodate your, your needs. So it, it sketches the, the heterogeneity of the partner and supplier landscape and certainly the, the cloud service providers. Um, well, let's get back out of, out of the rabbit hole. That was because, where, where were we? So uh, doing a survey of that's right. Yeah, yeah. Am I am I a good am I a good customer? I think you know, and be, but because the relation. Sorry, I'm back on track. Because the relationship is asymmetrical, the customer is is uh, is the more powerful with the one who has to be deferred to. Yeah. Um, who has the dare, money? Don't dare to ask it. But we should. And I think in if you're if you've got a long term relationship with with a um, between a provider and a consumer customer, then you should you should dare to ask that kind of question. When I used to um, provide service to as an application management service provider, commercial services to a customer, one of our long standing customers, we had the habit in the Develop the habit in the the yearly appraisal of the service that we done, sort of evaluating how did it go. I had the question to the always to, to the customer, and what did you learn from it? How did our interaction help you to improve how we interact from mm. your side? It's sort of, and I had a great, I had wonderful colleague in the team who had the habit, and certainly when things were going pear shaped in the relationship and. And, and where we were sort of being blamed for for stuff, he would say, "Dear customer, what would you like to do with your system? What what would you like us to do with your system?" Emphasizing, "It's not our system. We're maintaining it for you. We're doing our best to keep it in in good working state, but it's your system." And just using that phrase, "your system," was such yeah. a refined way of helping the customer realize oh yes it is my system i do have these responsibilities i pro possibly don't want to hear it yes but it's i um, want to make it somebody else's problem but yeah yeah practically i can't no you're sort of being being confronted with uh yeah so, that, so I here's that, an interesting uh, um, thought um um most of the agile methods, and I know certainly the, the stuff that I'm involved with, uh, promotes the idea that product owners should be fairly senior people on the business side of the fence. Um, what can product owners do to better engage with their user community yeah. to maybe realize their responsibility or what they're accountable for yeah yeah no i get that uh, firstly uh, product owners um good product owners few and far between it's difficult to find people with the with the authority the legitimacy the skills that you need to do this job some people are just parachuted in you know you're the product owner go and talk to those and you could I, it might be taken a bit far, but it's it's a nice provocative statement. I think the, the business was suckered into the role. It was you could you could come up with a case that IT said, you know, we're fed up with with trying to um, cons uh, reconcile these these diverse uh, requirements. You know, he wants this and she wants that, and it's not our problem; it's their problem. So we said to the business, business, you've got to appoint a product owner to sort this out for us. Then we could sit back and just wait for them to sort it out. Yeah, and but I don't think that's, it's just, that's true. It's, but it's, it's, it's the, the law of conservation of spaghetti. You haven't reduced the complexity. You've just shifted it to another another place. So now these poor product owners 
are struggling with that same problem that we were struggling with in the past, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. And if you, but, but back to your question, if the, then it's the scope, when is the product owner finished? Do they, and it's also, it's about, are you going back to the, the Stoics, um, Epictetus, old ancient mm -hmm. Greek, the circle of control and influence and concern that Stephen Covey made popular it goes yeah. you know, way back. You know, what can you control? Yeah, you as as the IT department, as the provider, you can't you can't control what your customer does. Uh, you should certainly be concerned about it, whether they're getting the in-use value that justifies mm. your exchange value, at least if it's a commercial relationship. Um, but what's yeah? What's your influence? That's um, but it's but they've got enough on their plate at the moment. I think I think it's a it's a very interesting question you know, proposition to extend the scope of the product owner to include the service component as well. Getting a little bit into the area of what do we what do we understand by service and product? That's another rabbit hole that we could uh, we could ex explore. But they, at the moment they're 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 just struggling with the with, with with the current scope, I think. Yeah, but I've certainly got customers that's that's flying um, with the simplest of all of the agile methods, Scrum. Um, okay. Yep. And um, but but they took it to heart, and they 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 basically said, "So, who's who's the person?" Um, there's, there's a technique called story mapping. I don't know if you've uh, ever known about story mapping. Uh, we use that in in um, design sprints. There's there's a role in a design sprint that's called the decision maker. A decision maker is somebody who can say, okay, we're going to go ahead and do this. And there's nobody higher up that can say no. Um, and and uh, to a large extent, the product owners are... Uh, are, are like that yeah they they're so senior in the organization that they can actually make the decision and say that's what we're going with um yeah some of them now i'm talking about the specific scenario yeah, sure. yeah, and, yeah, and the, the, the value that yeah. the organization is getting is so we started in it it's it's now a mandate of the chief uh, operating officer to use the same approach throughout the organization and they don't they don't uh, FMCG food manufacturers. So I mean, they they run things like bakeries and mills and and factories and 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 those principles and uh, and uh, principles more than method is now being rolled out across the, the organisation, and it's absolutely awesome. It's 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 great when when you sit back and you look at at, at somebody and you say, okay, it's working there. Um, um, I actually did make a difference. <laughs> yeah, because quite often, I mean, what do you do as a consultant if you if you give advice and people don't follow it? <laughs> yeah, well, well, that that's that's the um, that's one of the frustrations about being a consultant. Often you you're engaged to do something, and you do you you do your best. You do your honest best, uh, but often you you are not again in the in the you don't have the opportunity to to discover what they've actually done with it. So you, you don't really know, and and quite often um, people do other things. Yeah, which, no, for might, sure. which could be fine. And, and in fact, your your bad my bad idea might have triggered a better idea that they come up with you know so in a sense you've had a you fulfilled a fulfilled a function but it's a um, tough I tough life the western sun is creeping in as you move back it hits your ear yeah that's right yeah I'll, I'll make... <laughs> no don't bother about it i'm just smiling because we spoke, spoke yeah, about no, it a little bit earlier um, well, yeah. it's just a chink yeah. a chink in the in the curtains to the to the west a lovely day, by the way, here in, in uh, just uh, uh, about uh, ten kilometres south of Amsterdam. Yeah. So you're in Nieuwkerk, or where are you? Oudekerk. Oudekerk. Oudekerk and yeah. the Amstel, the Amstel River. 
from which the the city name Amsterdam was derived. Yes, Am Amsterdam. I think it, that's sort of got changed over over the years. Um, so, you, so is there any parallel in the in the th the three three crosses uh, and what we're talking about? Yeah, you know, the things that we need to say, not that. <laughs> 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 uh, that's yeah that's that's nice um uh the cross is another rabbit hole but it's an entertaining one for for the listeners um the three crosses black on red the amsterdam city flag quite distinctive i'm sure if you see it you recognize it. oh yeah pretty cool flag there's a guy um, called Roman Mars who does a, does a podcast, um, what's it called 99PI, I think. And he did a great TED talk on, I've got to say it well, vexillology, vexillology, vexillology. Study, the study of, that's wrong, I think it's, this, it's difficult to pronounce, the study of flags. Okay is absolutely fabulous ted talk so it's short very amusing very educational so look him up roman yeah. mars ted talk so flags that was about three curses or, or, or and it, well, he, he <coughs> excuse me he uses the example of the of the three crosses in the amsterdam flag as a pretty um pretty pretty good example of what a what a city flag should look like And it refers to basic design principles, which okay. apply to uh, apply to flags. But what were Fe the vexology? Vexology, vexology, logical. No. What, mm, yeah. what were the three curses that were? Is it forsworn? Is that the right word that I'm using? What's that? The the three crosses is to yeah. represents um, uh, for swearing a. A bad omen or a curse. Or I don't. A, I don't know. To, I don't know. To be honest, I'm not sure what I, I should. I should know. Being a having the uh, the, okay, the so Dutch that, citizenship that, as well as the British citizenship. I, I should. I should understand these things. Um, so go and look it up. Um, I know yeah, that that's the reason for the process. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So this is clearly early days, and. Um, I think as organizations most probably start operating in a less siloed manner and hopefully as IT departments uh, as they stand today start disappearing um, and, and the, the skills move into the business so that we don't have IT versus the business. Um, that, that could be a very interesting uh, area to explore further. Now, it, I always say to my kids, never take accountability for something that you do not have the authority to make happen. Um, because that's they're just setting yourself up for, uh, for, for, for failure. You're a sucker for punishment. And that's what IT does quite a lot. Yeah? We, we did, we've got very little control over what our customers do with the products and services that we, that we offer them. Yeah, true. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. There used to be, you know, in the good old days, there used to be. Um, uh, IT was uh, was sacred, was magical, was put on a pedestal. But then, of course, it uh, it fell from its pedestal, and um, and as she lied, that's why. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. It, well, it's it's going going back to. Um, what I mentioned about once the initial value of an initiative has been determined, it only goes downhill from there, potentially. Yeah. Guy, guy, famous Dutch computer scientist Dijkstra, E.W. Dijkstra, uh, legendary quotes. One of his quotes was, computer's core challenge, challenge is how not to make a mess of it. Okay. And he referred to the 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 role of the humble programmer 
who is aware of his or her ignorance, you know, the older we get, certainly for me, the more I realize how little I know, um, referred to by a very fancy term, epistemic humility, okay. which, I like, which I like to bandy around at parties. It impresses people immensely. As does the thought experiment, which I'm going to apply to you, um, about becoming a vampire. I don't know whether you've come, have you come across this before, the thought experiment about becoming... No, no I haven't. Well, it, not many people know this, but in, in fact, I'm a vampire. It's okay. not, uh, you don't see it on the outside, but I've, uh, I've got, some, uh, got some odd habits uh, and an av aversion to garlic and, um, and certain things. But it's great. It's really, Johan, it's really great being a... You should become a vampire. You know, you hear stories about blood, but it's, yeah, it's, it's not... It's, there are so many benefits to becoming a vampire. Now, the thought experiment is... Can you take, find enough information to take a decision, well-informed decision, to whether you're going to become a vampire or not? Okay. Um, okay, and and you you information or data? Um, Whatever you like. Can you take a decision? Can you take a, a rational decision? With enough certainty, um, no, make, you'll most probably do an emotional decision. Yeah. Well, the the, the thought experiment is, and it's a, a lady, Laurie Paul. Uh, she goes as a writer's L. A. Paul. Mm -hmm. um, she says, "You you don't you won't you won't know until you've done it, until you have experienced becoming a vampire, being a vampire." You have no yeah. idea. You, you have no way of of knowing whether what it's like to become a vampire. So, in a sense, it's a leap of faith. Yeah, which means that not we got on. We're talking about ep, humble programmer, epistemic humility. It brought me to the realization that knowledge is not only limited. I have don't have much knowledge about stuff, but it's also limiting. If you base your decisions on, and I thought it was quite a nice, nice way of putting it, limited and limiting, it, it limits your decisions. If your decisions are post-rationally based on information, you can't possibly take such a, you have to take a leap of faith, which means you have to trust your gut feelings more, believe, and probably things that we tend to ignore because we're rational so-called rational people or we tell ourselves stories that were rational we, you know we we've got to come up with a rational story before we do something but, but i think we should we should trust our feelings more and again referring to the ancient greeks the greeks had two words for for time one is yeah. chronos which okay we're all familiar with chronology sequential time but they had another had another word uh, for time kairos and kairos refers to sensing when the time is right to do something. I thought this. Okay. I like that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so trusting your gut feelings a bit more. And, and again, it's getting a bit back to the theme of service and the emotional individual evaluation, subjective evaluation of, of service. Um, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not about knowledge. It's about feelings as well. It's, yeah. it's the undercurrent. And if you've been in an organization, for instance, if you've been, if you worked in an organization for a long time, for five years, for 10 years, you know, even if you possibly can't articulate it in words, you will feel what's going to work and what's not going to work. And, and the fact that you can't articulate it is not necessarily the reason why you shouldn't do it. So you should, no, it's so. not a bad thing that, yeah. Uh, and, and, but but let's face it. I mean, it, it doesn't matter how much we're trying to tell ourselves that we are logical and rational beings. We're not. Um, uh, there's just too much evidence to show the contrary. Was it what was the the um, uh, Kahneman uh, fast and yeah. slow? Yeah, so book, there books up there somewhere. Interesting yeah. uh, stuff there. Thinking fast, uh, thinking slow. Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay.
So here's, here's a thought from my side. I think one of the things that service and, and product providers could do is to have a better conversation with the users about the use of their products and service, but excluding their product and service. So talk about the job, not about talking about how do you use my tool to do the job. Yeah, no, that's right. The fact you it's it's in the words that people use. People talk about a, the people who talk about a product are often the people who produce the product because that's their business. We produce products, that's what we do. The user isn't interested in a product. He's, he's interested in, in a in a resource, in a tool. Um Mm -hmm. you happen to call it a product so i'll go along with you and i'll buy a product but it's i'm not buying a product i'm buying a tool yeah um you mentioned product ownership we should also realize and i'm not quite sure how the distinction is is used product ownership product management are often used as two separate domains not quite sure mm -hmm. how how they interact the the, the, the one is more in the marketing domain, the product management. Um, yeah, marketing. it depends. It depends who you talk to. If another another idea for our listeners to um, uh, possibly to look up John Cutler, who's on Twitter as Cuttlefish, he's brilliant on product management, product ownership. He's really worth mm -hmm. taking a look at. Enormous respect for the kind of things he com comes up with and the kind of questions that he poses. Okay. It really, get, really gets you thinking about stuff. John John Cutler. Cutler. Yeah. Or Cutler. A U or a O? With a, a U. Okay. Cutler. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm clearly a big Christensen fan, and uh, uh, but I... Uh, I find the most helpful book in terms of just that thing that I said now is, is this one. Um, really oh, yeah. yeah. So this is, for me, a, a, a nice balance between the very marketing approach you know, that some people in Jobs to be Done do and the very analytical approach um, that Anthony Ulrich is doing. So a nice balance in between. Um, and uh, as you could see, it it was lying handy because I use it virtually <laughs> daily. Well, speak, speaking about marketing, if you see that orange book there, also strategically positioned, Seth Godin. Okay. Is I think it's his, his 19th or 20th book. He, he writes them very easily. But I have learned so much about marketing from, from Seth Godin. Okay, I have to do this just to see. Right, okay. Do you mean this one? <laughs> the, the very, the very one. Did it just arrive by DHL? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's yeah. it's such a fabulous, fabulous book. It's really is worth. It, it doesn't I think it doesn't cost much more than ten or fifteen dollars. Yeah, worth every cent. Basic yeah. questions. Basic questions like. Uh, which we should be thinking about as well when we we promote our stuff. Who's it for and what's it for? Yes. Those are simple questions. Who's it for? Those are difficult questions to answer. Yeah, but this is the cool thing about jobs to be done is you identify who are the actors, the, the role players, and then you have a conversation with them about what they're doing. And, and, and you know, by, by going through that process of actually mapping these jobs to be done you've got a much better understanding who is it for and what's it for yeah 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 and uh and the contribution con contribution that your your service will make seth talks about making a marketing assertion okay. which I, I played around with quite a bit uh, for people who believe this and want that this service will help them do something. If you okay. think about that, it really helps you think those two basic questions, who's it for and what's it for? 
it, it helps you formulate your your bold offer which is often scary it says you know here i i made this it's for you so it's a vulnerable statement you know for, i've written a couple of books and with each with each book it's a you're writing it for for an ideal reader you have an ideal reader in mind to try and formulate what what kind of uh, knowledge beliefs uh, desires and feelings do people have before they've read the book what kind of knowledge what kind of change in knowledge um, beliefs abilities and feelings would you like to impart after they read the book so you've got this ideal reader so you you write your book and then you offer it to people here i wrote this but most of the people in the world aren't interested. It's not for them. He likes to talk about the, the concept of the minim, minimum viable audience. Yeah. That really, that little, the people that, who you are serving the best, if you serve them the best, they'll spread the word, they'll do the marketing, marketing for you. But it's scary choosing a small audience because you can't hide behind mediocrity and say, you know, it's for yeah. everybody. It's not for everybody. Yes. You've got to be bold. But nothing is for everybody. Do you know what this makes me think of? Is one of the other Peter Drucker quotes. I'm also a big Peter Drucker quote uh, fan, as you as you can pick up. Um, he said that uh, uh, our customers rarely buy our products for the reason that we, we yeah, think yeah, yeah. they do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, yeah. I've had a similar experience lately. You know, so. The latest book was written for a very specific target, um, but they're not really that interested in it. There's other people who like it, though. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> I, I had a similar experience with the IT for IT forum, part of the open group that I was involved with developing the IT for IT standard, uh, initially conceived as a way of uh, in improving the interoperability of tooling within the IT domain so that the various tools from various vendors communicated better, exchanged data better mm -hmm. with each other, um, which is a, it's a, that's a long play. It's a, really, it's only when customers dictate that you have to conform to the standard that vendors will adopt yeah. the standard. But because they came up with a pretty cool diagram of depicting the whole value streams you know the four value streams they talk about people who they weren't originally intending to target they were interested in that and it took off for a completely different reason so you know you you, you don't you don't know and yeah. and that's and that's why it's good to not have a grand plan but to take things step by step and be open for mm the changes that your intervention makes inter intervention makes and taking taking uh, advantage of the opportunities that you would have missed if you were marching towards that predetermined uh, destination yeah but it it's it's not a nice feeling though when you when you are so sure <laughs> that Ep this is my target audience yeah, epistemic <laughs> humility, my dear. Epistemic yeah, humility. Yeah, well, that's clearly something that I'm not good at. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, 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 I love. Yeah, and I think the first time that we met, I actually talked about Marcus Aurelius, and that reminded you that your dad gave the book to you when you were a youngster. Um. Yeah, but I, I, I find it difficult to to be a good Stoic or a good Buddhist. Mm, yeah, <laughs> you got to work at these things. These, these things don't come for free. I um, do, however, find is it gets easier as you get older. Um, ego is much less of, a, of an issue mm. if you if you actually realize that it it you never mattered, uh, and uh, other people's opinion about you really doesn't matter. Um, and uh, it's not necessarily going to you know, make the world a different place if 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 they've got a different opinion. Just yeah. what it is. I came across it must be maybe ten to fifteen years ago now a, a short interview with the Dalai Lama that uh, that stuck with me. Still 
sort of influenced it's sort of a religion religion in a sense guiding principles it was an australian interviewer who asked him you know you sort of stick a microphone in front of the dalai lama what question do you ask him what is the meaning of life it was the only question that's worth so what he comes up with um, meaning of life happiness and usefulness is yeah, the meaning of life that. Surely our life is not for suffering, not for trouble. And those two words, happiness and usefulness. And what works for me, just the way my DNA works, if I'm useful, if I've got the illusion that I've helped somebody, I feel happy about it. Mm. So through the vehicle of being useful, serving. That's, if you focus on those two things, being happy, being useful, it takes you quite decent mileage out of that. But yeah, you know, it's it's sort of part of the hierarchy of needs. I mean, we all want to be useful, feel useful, not be useful, feel that. Yeah, no, that's right. It's uh, useful, it's, and that we've made a difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, my, and, and, my equivalent of Hertzberg's uh, the stack is, or Maslow's, and you know, the one is bigger than the other one is smaller. It's to live, to love, and to leave a legacy. Yeah. So, and if you've oh, yeah, those yeah. three things, then yeah, I suppose you can be a fulfilled human being. Um, not only to be, it's this is Adam Smith. Um, not only to be loved, but to be to be lovely. By which okay. he means deserving love. Okay. But have, having okay. done things, yes. having done things with the right <clears throat> intent, and that's um, that's a pretty that's a pretty good one as well guy called russ roberts who does a fabulous podcast econ talk originally started off for economists but it's okay. much broader now fabulous be doing it for 16 years weekly very very good he he wrote a book on Ad, something like what can i learn from adams adam smith fabulous little book but those that the, the people often have have the wrong impression of adam smith but he had a was much more nuanced view of the world and that bit about being loved and lovely mm. that's that's resonated with me doing things for the right, yeah, the right I, I think we can we can blame the chicago school of economics economics for much of that um we we smith was was held up as the ratchet rationalization of the statement that you know the purpose of a business is to make money yeah um and and that was that was not Smith. Uh, Smith no, was was was, yeah. was a community person. He clearly understood that business happens within a community. Yeah, no, it's mis mistaken. I think his. Um, so who was that now? Um, the guy who said Mal Malcolm Friedman. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's a that's a terrible perversion of the truth. So once again, I, I prefer Drucker's version is that the purpose of a business is to make a customer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah nice way, nice way to end, isn't it? Creating yeah. customers. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Mark, it was really awesome to chat with you again. We haven't spoken for quite some time. Um, we've been in conversations, but we haven't spoken. Yeah, it was, um, good. And I, it was good. I cannot wait to get back on a plane and get back to the Netherlands and I'll certainly come and look you up and buy you a beer. Yeah, please do. Well, I've, I've stopped drinking. I think I'm on the fifth Ooh. year of not uh, consuming Completely. alcohol. Hmm? Completely. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I decided yeah. I, on the, on the, I, it was as a bit of an experiment. I thought I'm going to stop drinking for three months. Mm. Um, and then it became six months and then it became addicted. And, and I see. I feel feel better, but I would say that, wouldn't I? Yeah. Um, the the major benefit is it makes you feel so smug about things, <laughs> not drinking. I don't know if that's a benefit though. Um, yeah. But, it, but it, it's it, it's pretty much the same as my 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 smoking. Um, yeah, I stopped smoking twenty fifth of May two thousand and nine, and in the in the beginning I didn't stop smoking. I just I I I said for the next month I'm not gonna and for the next month I'm not gonna yeah and uh, I can genuinely say that I do feel better although I put up put on weight because um, 
you have to stick things into your mouth if you've got the habit, yes? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> that's, that's the benefit of alcohol. If you stop drinking alcohol, you lose weight. You lose weight, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that, that, was, that was, in fact, the trigger. It was just after Christmas, and I just passed the 70 kilogram measure, which for me, that's a bit much. So I thought, um, not having anything of this, I'll stop drinking for three months, see what happens. Anyway, I'm down to about 63, 64 now, and that's pretty pretty constant. I, f I feel good with it, so I'm, so I'm sticking with it. And it was surprisingly easy, which okay. I believe is less so with with tobacco. Yes. Now, that was hard. Um, I, I stopped quite a few times, and it really, yeah. The only way to stop smoking is to stop smoking. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, Stephen Covey also said, the only way to trust somebody is to trust them. Hmm. <laughs> oh, that this was absolutely awesome. We're spot on on the hour, um, yeah. so thank you very much. And uh, I hope I can I can uh, push on your button next year to have a similar conversation yeah. because I can't believe the response. Uh, my year is completely full. Absolutely yeah, no, good. awesome. Good, good um, for you. Yeah, I given the current circumstances i would like to apologize to our ukrainian friends uh, for suspending reality for an hour yeah and um, pretending that this was important yeah it is um it's heartbreaking um I don't know what's happening now. I'm trying to put the slides back. Um, and we're with you in our thoughts. I just wish we could do more. Um, and certainly speaking up um, is an important thing that we can do. So on that sober note, I'm going to end the broadcast. Thank you for listening.